Amen. You may be seated. We are in the midst of a sermon series called Holy. And throughout this series, we are uh, identifying holes in our faith in order to have a more whole faith. And, and so what we're doing is we're looking at uh, various streams, if you will, of Christianity and the way that people have experienced uh, God before. And so as we look at the historic church, we do identify several major streams, six major streams by which people are experiencing God. And the first week we talked about uh, the contemplative stream and what it looks like to have a prayer-filled life. And specifically, we talked about being connected to Christ, being cut by the Father, the gardener, and uh, calling on God. And the week after that, we talked about the holiness stream and what it looked like to live um, a virtuous life. And we talked about the importance of Paul's uh, advice to Timothy in 2 Timothy, which is where we'll be today as well, uh, where he tells him to not allow his life to be filled with garbage. As he would say, don't be a vessel for dishonor, but instead allow yourself to be set aside for sacred, special purposes, a vessel used for honor. And of course, one of the things I recognize is as we've been working through this is, is not just how people experience God, but it's also when you look at Jesus Christ and his life, he perfectly encompasses all of these things. He is both prayer-filled and virtuous. And he's also what we'll speak on today, which is the evangelical stream. What it looks like to have a word-centered life. As we do this, hopefully we're looking inwardly and we're going, man, is there, is there part of my faith that is challenged by this? Am I lacking in any area uh, that comes naturally to Jesus or, or that I see in the life of Paul or that I see very clearly in the scriptures? Is there part of my faith that could be uh, grown? And so today we're gonna look at the word-centered life. And particularly, historically, evangelicals are well known for two things. One, knowing the word, and two, sharing the word. Knowing the word and sharing the word. And so we see that very clearly in this passage that we'll be reading in today, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. Paul's words to Timothy. And uh, Paul, as he's writing 2 Timothy, making subtle hints that the end of his life is near, he recognizes that Timothy won't have him for long. And so one of the things that he's doing is he's saying, you have everything you need here, right? So uh, this is what he says, as for you, verse 14, chapter 3, 2 Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Timothy's grandmother and his mother have grown him up in the Judeo-Christian faith and Paul has helped to mentor him. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is so know the word and is useful for, and this is the share the word part, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see very clearly, Paul wants Timothy to know the scriptures. Man, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. You have known the scriptures since infancy. Know the scriptures. Continue to know them. Uh, the first question that might come to mind is, well, what exactly is the scriptures? And of course, we know them to be the Old and New Testament. Jesus will talk about the Old Testament as the law and the prophets. And even when he does, sometimes he'll quote a psalm and refer to it as the law. And so Jesus will look at all the Old Testament that we look at, and he will say that it is scripture. And the, 
the New Testament as well. These writers of the Gospels and these letters that are being circulated and written to churches. Um, Peter, at one point, 2 Peter 3.16, refers to these writings as Scripture. 2 Peter 3.15 and 16, he says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. We would agree with that. Which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures uh, to their own destruction. So Peter, an apostle, an early church leader, will look at Paul's writings and refer to them as scripture. And so the holy scriptures that Paul is talking about are both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you might say, or some might say, well, that sounds like circular reasoning, right? If the scriptures call themselves scriptures and so we uh, know that they are scriptures, isn't that just circular reasoning? And a great thing to recognize is that there is such a thing as a noble circle. In other words, you want a paradigm and a worldview that is internally consistent. There is such a thing as a noble circle. Uh, and so people that are involved in apologetics, when they're measuring worldviews, one of the things that they look for is, does this worldview, is it self-contradicting? And if so, not truthful. Uh, or is it internally consistent? There is such a thing as a noble circle. And Paul will also say, these holy scriptures are useful. Uh, let's get the language right here. Uh, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's an interesting phrase, to make you wise for salvation. One of the things that we recognize is that the scriptures, or salvation rather, is both, uh, all three. It's past, it's present, and it's future. There's past salvation, where I give my life to Jesus. On that day, I've experienced salvation. There's a present salvation where Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And there's a future salvation in which judgment day happens and I will be saved from the consequences and effects and guilt of my sin. Future salvation. Uh, but so this present salvation is what Paul is referring to when he says the scriptures make us wise for salvation. In other words, how I know to live a saved life is by knowing the scriptures. The scriptures teach me how to live out those outworkings of my salvation. And they allow me to do so skillfully or with wisdom. And then he'll say that all scripture is God-breathed. We fill in that word, God breathed, we fill in that phrase automatically in our minds. If we were to talk about what does it mean to be God breathed, we would probably say something like uh, God inspired the authors as they were writing the original manuscripts and, and he uh, made sure that those words were inerrant and infallible and we fill that in. Partly because the King James Version, instead of using the word God breathed, will use the word inspired. Um, but that passage, does, I do believe that the scriptures are inspired. Um, don't hear me saying otherwise, and don't quote me as saying otherwise. Um, uh, the reason King James Version uses that word inspiration is because it, it means uh, inhale, just like expiration means exhale. And so the, the word of God is breathe. And, and that's the Greek word, God breathed. It's a compound word that means God breathed. And it looks like uh, Paul may have been the first person to use it. It looks like he's made that word up as we try and find that word in the Greek. In other sources, you find it in secular sources 100 to 200 years after Paul has used it. Uh, and so he's saying that the word of God is God breathed. And the question is, what would that have meant to a uh, original audience? What would that have meant to somebody reading that scripture as an early Jew, an early Christian? 
And I think one of the things that you would automatically bring to mind when you hear God breathe is Adam. God breathes life into Adam. And so Adam is energized by the life force of the Spirit. And, and so one of the things that Hebrews will say of Scripture is that it's alive and active. That's what it means to be God-breathed, that this word is alive and active, which is fascinating. So we would recognize there are books and authors and fiction that, that entertains us and um, holds our attention and you know, really is really captivating, whether it's Stephen King or C.S. Lewis or Lord of the Rings, whatever you're reading and, and whatever you enjoy, recognize that there are certain books that we enjoy and we like and they hold our attention. But we would also recognize as Christians that there's nothing like this, that this is distinctly alive and active and through it, God is at work. His grace is mediated from this word to me as I read it with faith and with the help of the Holy Spirit. God's word is alive and active. And, uh, the question is, does it mean God breathed in, that God's breathing into the scriptures, or does it mean that God is breathing out the scriptures? And we really don't know. And so we would also maybe think of Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 11, in which it said, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That God's word is breathed out, that it finds its source in him and will be used to accomplish his purposes. Man, if I'm a Christ follower, I want to know the word, just like Jesus knew the word. And then afterwards, Paul will say, it's useful for teaching. In other words, scripture is useful for, that word teaching is tied to doctrine. It's useful for teaching truths about God. This is how God reveals himself to us. It's how we know for certain certain things about who God is. And so it's different from uh, philosophizing. It's different from theorizing. We get to explore truths about God that are um, fundamental and foundational and indisputable because he reveals himself through scripture. So I was, um, I got breakfast with somebody the other day. We're having small talk, and, and that small talk turns into a talk about God, medium, or, or big talk now. And as we're talking, we're reading through Scripture together, opening the Bible and showing him certain passages. And I love it, and I love getting to see this is what God says about himself. Teaching happens through Scripture. I had a small group leader in my office, and, and she was talking to me about um, God. And we didn't even get onto the topic of small groups. So we're just, uh, she's sharing Scripture passages and the meaning of them. I'm sharing Scripture passages, and we're just going back and forth talking about Scripture. And this is one of the things that God wants us to experience, knowing the Scriptures so that we can teach. But then he also says rebuking. This word means convicting. I mean, very plainly, Scripture is useful for making people feel bad about their sin. That's what Paul says. And that's not a bad thing. Scripture is useful for making people feel bad about their sin. And one of my jobs, not as a pastor, but just as a brother in Christ, is to make people feel bad about their sins. One of your jobs as a brother or sister in Christ is to make people feel bad about their sins. Scripture does call us to gently rebuke one another. To, to call each other back, to care for one another. Wounds from a friend are faithful, but an enemy multiplies kisses. We are. We're supposed to care for each other, love each other. Sometimes that means saying hard truths to each other. Um, but scripture is best for this. So I remember a time where I said something that um, was, was impolite or cutting or hurtful. And, and there's a person with me, and she said, Keith, that's, 
hurtful. And I said, I'm just joking. I don't mean it. It's just a joke. I was in college or something. And I was in college, not or something. And, uh, and she said, yes, but doesn't Jesus say that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks? And now I have, <laughs> now I get to argue with Jesus, and I don't want to do that. So I just go, oh, yeah, I think you've got a point, right? And so scripture is able to convict me in a way that is other. Because if I go, yeah, this is truth, and if you know scripture, then you can help me to feel bad about my sin. And if you don't know scripture, then you can't. Um, so, man, scripture is good for convicting, for rebuking. It's also good for correcting, Paul says to Timothy. So now that I feel bad about my sin, I want to know how do I live right? And scripture will tell me how to do that, to do that through the power of the Holy Spirit, to do that by, by constantly renewing my mind, and, and so on and so forth. Scripture is good for correcting. And then Paul finally, he ends by saying that it's good for training in righteousness. This word training is um, the same word they would use for kind of parenting, disciplining, growing a child up. In other words, Scripture is good for pre-K through graduation, uh, for righteousness. It's good for me to know how to follow Jesus. It's the curriculum of a Christ follower, Scripture. And so if I'm leaning in to this evangelical stream, I want to know the Word as much as I can. Just like Jesus knew the word as much as he could. Just like Paul knows the word as much as he can. I will want to know the word as much as I can. There's a, 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 the early church, they're fascinating because these church fathers who are writing about doctrine and theology and leading churches, and some of them are disciples of the disciples. They're very early church leaders. Um, one of them, I think it's Clement, writes on average eight, seven to eight scripture passages a page. His brain thinks the language of Scripture. And they're not writing references down because they don't have chapters and verses yet. And so they'll say, uh, in, sometimes they won't even say, it. it'll just be part of how they're thinking. Scripture will flow out of them. Just like uh, when you read James, the Sermon on the Mount is flowing out of him. Uh, there's so many connections to James and the Sermon on the Mount because he knows Jesus' words so well that it becomes the language of his thoughts. We want to know the Word. And we also want to share the Word because it's impossible for me to effectively share the Gospel. It's impossible for me to effectively teach truths about God. It's impossible for me to effectively uh, convict and correct and train someone in righteousness without it. Know the word and share the word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that there is a text that is unlike any other text in this world. That there is a way that you have revealed yourself to nations and generations of people to know truths about who you are. In a way that's unlike any other text, any other experience, any other source. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless us, that you would give us grace and abundance, that we would allow this truth to permeate to our core. God, that, that we would allow ourselves to know Scripture, as, as difficult as it may be sometimes to read uh, Scriptures that are written originally to different people, but they were also written for us, to others, but for all of us. God, and to recognize that these are God-breathed in a way that's totally other 
Father, to know the scriptures so that we can share the scriptures, so that we can teach, so that we can rebuke and convict as a good friend, as a good brother or sister in Christ, as somebody that, that wants to care for others and, and love them well, to help correct not only our, our own lives, definitely our own lives, and also to be able to correct the lives of others in ways that are helpful and true, and to train in righteousness, Father, that, uh, that we would recognize that the word, your word, both Old Testament and New Testament, is a curriculum for living out the faith. We love you, God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.